If I've said it once here, I've said it a thousand times, that so much of life that we live is lived day by day, situation by situation, and really response by response. All of our lives contain not only situations that go on, but really our, our reactions to them. And if you think about most of our regrets in life, almost always we regret the way we reacted to something. One of the things that I always like to say, and if you've been around Crossroads at all, you've heard me say it many times, that really what God is interested in in our lives is what the Bible calls discipleship, which is us becoming people who are learning from Jesus. And I like to define discipleship is how God transforms our natural reactions to biblical responses. It's, it's a subtle definition. Our natural reactions, you think about your reactions, they almost always, they happen almost like an impulse. Something goes on, you, you react to it, right? But then what goes on is there's a difference between a reaction, which is impulsive, versus a response, which a response has an intentionality to it or a focus to what you're saying. I actually want this type of life. And so my reactions, my natural impulses aren't what I want to do. There's something else that I want to do. There's a, there's a higher ideal that I'm working towards. I'll, I'll share something from my own life. And I always like to remind people that I I get the pleasure of being in process in public. And so, and because I'm so exceedingly flawed and Jesus' grace is so exceedingly good, I have lots of material from my own life. So, you know, I've said it many times, you know it. Like, so I'm a kid from, from the New York metropolitan area, right? And so growing up in the New York metropolitan area, now I grew up in New Jersey, but my whole family is from New York and my parents were the first ones to move to New Jersey because they couldn't buy a place in New York when they found out they're having twins that they couldn't afford. So they moved out to the sticks of New Jersey, but the New York metro area is a big area and New Yorkers are known for their truthful communications, <laughs> right? They're, they're big mouths, right? And, and so I was nurtured in an environment where there was a lot of quick back and forth conversations. And normally they were pretty um, aggressive or, you know, kind of uh, biting. I remember growing up, uh, I, had, I had a friend who worked for uh, Campus Crusade for years and he did the, the New Jersey crew and they used to have, go to their, their national conferences and they would wear shirts that say New Jersey crew where the weak are killed and eaten. You know, and people would, would sign up to go to, to be a campus minister through Campus Crusade. And, and literally, people would be like, you can send me anywhere, just don't send me to New Jersey. Right? And, and so really growing up, the way we learned how to communicate was, you know, people would, like, if they liked you, they'd pick on you. Because sarcasm was a love language. Which it really isn't, but that's the way it was. And, and, if, and if they knew that you had a weakness, they would kind of exploit that weakness until you, you didn't show weakness anymore. So you can imagine little Danny Fusco, just like a young dude, you know, and, and it was like, I was just, everything was like hopping the ball. And I'll never forget when I started walking with Jesus, you know, and I moved out of the New York metropolitan area, I realized that everybody wasn't like that. And I remember when I started uh, really growing in my faith, I was at a, a church with my pastor, John Henry Corcoran, and I remember there was a situation that was going on and me and one of the elders was kind of like hopping the ball back and forth. And it was very quick. And John Henry was just standing there. And then after it was over, he's like, Daniel. And he's from Ireland. He's like, Daniel, my brother, you are older than me. No, no that's, that's actually, that's Elton John lyrics anyway. But, but he was just, he was like, he's like, Daniel, he's like, you are very quick witted. You can hop the ball. He's like, but I'm pretty sure that's going to get you in trouble. And I, and I remember just thinking to myself, I'm like, is that going to get me in trouble? And then I realized that actually I've been in trouble for this my whole life. But sometimes, especially when somebody says something to you that is almost like uh, diminishing or demeaning towards you, or is meant to kind of put you in your place, that kind of New York kind of, oh yeah, you know, like, like well, let me, let's, you want to talk about me? Let's talk about you. And what happens so fast that what I realized is that without even thinking, my natural reactions in conversation would to be like, oh, this time. You know, it's like that whole, uh, I remember when I was on the bumper sticker, there was a, a Gandhi quote that an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. It sounds like good wisdom, except it's actually in the Bible so that people don't escalate. And I'm like, oh, I know the art of escalation. 
You know, you say something mean to me, I'll talk about your whole family. Like, you know, like, and, and not that it's right. It was like, I was just nurtured that way. And when I really started walking with Jesus and my pastor's kind of challenge, I realized I'm like, oh wait, what I want to do naturally actually isn't godly. It's not holy. It doesn't honor God or people. And then, it, and then you start that process of like unlearning. Now, if I, if I add on to that, my beloved bride, Lynn, who I love so much, when Lynn and I uh, got together, Lynn is a words of affirmation person, which is a lethal combination when you have somebody who, if they love you, they make fun of you all the time. And, and I remember when we, in the beginning of our marriage, I would just say things in her, and I would be making jokes and her whole countenance would, would frown. And I'm just like, oh. I'm such an idiot, right? And so it begins this process where you realize, for me, I realize that my natural impulsive reactions in conversation is not building up, it's tearing down. Now, I was raised to not think that that was a problem, but because of my faith in Jesus and life in his kingdom, I'm like, oh, this is a problem. So then you start this process of, Lord, I want you to, I want to unlearn this way of talking so that I can let my words, as the Bible say, be full of grace, seasoned with salt. That, I, that by being the wittiest and the most cutting is actually not an ideal, but actually being the kind of person that when people leave my presence, they feel built up and not torn down. And that is how discipleship works, right? And for each one of us, we have whatever these things are in our lives where Growing in discipleship is saying, Lord, this is what I would do impulsively, naturally, but now that my goal is to glorify you and to be a blessing to people, the way that I would do it naturally isn't the best way, so I want to learn a new way to do things. And God starts to transform, sometimes immediately, miraculously, and other times over the long, hard journey of discipleship, you start to learn how to say, I want this reaction to become a response that glorifies you. So if you ever notice, if we're, if, if, if we're ever standing there in the family room and someone says something that's mean to me, normally I'll just kind of smile and I'll look like this. And I do that so I just don't open my mouth. And like I have to think about it for a second. So if you catch me do it, just pray for me, just, you know. But like that's my journey. But so much of life in all of life is a life in response to how do we respond to our environment? How do we react to our environment? But as we walk as followers of Jesus, this life in response becomes, how do I simply respond to Jesus? How do I live in such a way that my life takes on the qualities of what does it mean to be a child of God? And in some ways, our series in Psalm 23 has been all about this, right? Right? And, I, and so many of you have talked to me and say, Pastor, I love that we're doing Psalm 23. I love that we've taken a slow journey through it to kind of soak in it. And so today is going to be our last message in this wild series in Psalm 23. And I think it's so important for all of us. You know, our Bibles are amazing. From Genesis to Revelation, the Word of God is deep. There's so much in it. But there should be areas in the Bible that we really say, these are anchor points for my faith, right? Like, like the Sermon on the Mount, it's all an anchor, but like you can't spend all of your time in all of it. Does that make sense? And so for me, I'm always looking for what are the anchor points that when all else fails, if I, get, if I make sure I remember this, it's going to help me. Things like the Sermon on the Mount, things like the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. There's all these different pa passages. Uh, you, you think about, you know, scriptures like trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean on, on your understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your steps. Like these are anchor points. And I really want for us to let Psalm 23 to be an anchor point because it teaches us so much about what life is supposed to be in the kingdom, in Christ, as we're led by the Spirit. So everyone, open up your Bibles to Psalm 23. I'm actually gonna take the whole Psalm as one big thing. So open up your Bibles, Psalm 23, if you have Bibles, your Bibles with you. At this point, they just kind of break open to Psalm 23. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, there's Bibles on the seats in front of you. Uh, and of course, if you like to read it on your phone, we want you to do it. I want you to open it. We're gonna read it together in a second. 
But I do want you to keep it open because I'm going to be kind of referencing all these different verses here in Psalm 23. And so we have been having fun reading it together. So everyone stand on up together. Go ahead, stand on up. I want to make you guys do like the Macarena or something, but I'm not going to do it. It's just it's so hard, you know. You guys know how it goes. Okay, let's read Psalm 23 together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Great job. Give yourselves a round of applause. Give the person next to you a high five. So as we've walked through Psalm 23, slowly, verse by verse, concept by concept, I just wanted to kind of zoom out and kind of give you just three big ideas, taking the whole thing from like 30,000 feet. And the first thing is this, not only in this Psalm, but in life, it always starts with the Lord and what he does. You'll notice that in every stanza of Psalm 23, it starts with, this is who the Lord is, and this is what the Lord is doing. So it begins with the Lord. Things like in verse 1, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. In verse 2, he makes me to lie down. He leads me beside the still waters. Verse three, he restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Verse four, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they're the ones that bring me comfort. Verse five, you prepare a table before me. See, everything in our lives is initiated by God. Now, here's what I wanna tell you. This alone is the battleground of Christianity in contemporary culture, not just Western culture. Because our culture tells us, you get to do it your way. You do your spirituality, you do your politics, you do your ethics, you do your vocation, you just do your thing. And the Bible has the audacity to say, actually, no, God initiates all of it and God invites us into all of it. I always tell people the Bible is controversial from the very first verse when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. (laughs) Because it's saying all of this exists by God and for God and because of God. And I'm here to tell you that your life is not yours to live how you like. Your life is meant to be lived in response to who the Lord is and what he's doing. And I'm here to tell you in each one of our lives, on the journey of life, this is where the trouble exists. Because God is saying, listen, there's things that I want to do. There's changes that I want to make. There's transformation that I want to birth in your life. There are things that you have always done, your natural reactions, that I actually want to transform into biblical responses. Just because you were raised that way or you feel comfortable that way is not God's highest desire. He's saying, listen, it starts with me and what I'm doing. And for all of us, we have to learn how to trust that God is God and we are not. That God has a plan, that God has a will, and God is inviting us into that. But for all of us, what's hard is we feel comfortable with what we know, want, and understand. 
And what I love so much about the scriptures is the scriptures don't pretend like we're not human, doesn't pretend like it doesn't understand how we kind of roll through things. All through your Bible, every biblical account and story of what goes on almost always involves people and what they want and then what God is doing. And we often see people resisting what God is doing, people not liking what God is doing, taking a long time to get on board with what God is doing. And oftentimes, by the time you get to the end of whatever the story or the account is, you find that at best people realize that God is good and God knows what he's doing. And the same is true for all of our lives. The same is true for all the circumstances that we find ourselves in. So we have to learn how to remember that God is the initiator God is the sustainer. God's purposes and plans are going to come to pass whether we are willing participants or not. And so all through the scriptures, it starts with who the Lord is and what he's up to. Scholars call this being Christocentric. Look at your neighbor and say Christocentric. That's a good biblical word. I'll get you a bunch of points on words with friends or Scrabble. You know, the idea is that Jesus gets to be the center. It was uh, the writer and theologian, A.W. Tozer, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna paraphrase him. Uh, not, it's not an exact quote, but he said, I'll never forget when I read it, he said that in the heart of every believer, there is a cross and a throne. And for most people, they keep Jesus on the cross so they can sit on the throne, but for the truly mature believer, they take the cross so Jesus can have his rightful throne. It's a, it's a very powerful concept. It's about who sits as preeminent in your heart and your soul. Now, here's what I want to tell you. You might be like, well, listen, right now Jesus is on the throne and I am on the cross. But you know later on today you get cut off on the highway. You know it's going to switch real quick, <laughs> right? And so I don't want to be like totalistic about it. I just realized that in the journey of life, the key is to let Jesus as king of kings take that rightful place on the throne of our hearts. And we are perpetually saying, and that's why Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you need to deny yourself and take up your cross when? Daily. So it's, we do it one time unto salvation and then we're constantly denying ourselves and taking up the cross over and over and over again through life unto sanctification, unto maturity and growth in Jesus. I mean, Jesus said this exact same thing in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 40, which we commonly call the greatest commandment. It says, Jesus said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, if you've been around crosses for a while, we call this what? Upward, inward, and outward, right? That it always begins with our relationship with God is first. And we love God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind, according to the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love him, why? Because he first loved us. Right? God has initiated the relationship and we respond, that life in response, we respond to God's love for us with re returning love back to him. So it begins with God. So it's upward, this relationship with God, and then it's inward and outward because we love our neighbors, which is outward as what? As we love ourselves. Now I know people say, well, no, the Bible doesn't say you should love yourself. I'm like, just take it up with Jesus. It really, Jesus was quoting the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. As you love yourself, treat others as you would want to be treated. See, the Bible doesn't teach that we don't love ourselves. The Bible teaches that unless we know the love of God, we will always love ourselves in the wrong ways. Because we will love ourselves primarily, self-centeredly. But when you love God, then you see yourself and you love yourself the way God does. And I always like to tell people that God's, the way we love ourselves as believers is through the lens of the cross. Because that's how God loves us, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So we love ourselves in a cruciform shape. What does the cross teach us about ourselves? That we are flawed, that we are broken, that we are rebellious and sinful, and we're also deeply valuable to God and God desires to redeem us. As some scholars say, we are more treacherous and broken than we, can ever, than we would ever admit, and we're also more loved than we can ever hope for. The cross teaches us that, right? But it all begins with who the Lord is and what he's doing. And in each one of our lives, at street level where you live, whether it's in your family, 
or whether it's on your job, whether it's in your school, whether it's in your neighborhood, whether it's in the circumstances that you find yourself in online or in real life, God is working and he's always inviting. And for each one of us, the key is, will I simply respond to Jesus or will I just react as I would naturally to the situations and be like, I wish I didn't do that stuff. I was just talking to someone about this uh, I was so excited, and this was a, a bunch of months back, not someone here, so I'm not betraying anyone's confidences, but I was talking to someone who, who found themselves in the habit of every day after work having a couple drinks. And they realized, they're like, this is not good, right? Like, like it's just like, I'm just, like, I'm just, I can't wait for this. And they were talking about how they would come home, and it was like the thing that got them excited to go home was to drink and how they had to kind of learn some new ways to embrace being home. And, and, and it's such a simple thing because even if you look at all like the, the science of how habits are formed, it's the same thing where it's like you have this cue and then you have this response to this cue. So like, so like let me give you an example. So like cue, somebody says something that seems to be a little bit biting to me and my response is I'll make it worse. I'll say something bad about you. And then before you know it, the things, that was mine. In the same way, so it's like you come home and all you do is like, man, all I, I, just, I just need a drink when I get home. No, you don't. You're just used to having one. So instead of having a drink of alcohol, maybe you're just like, hey, man, I really love this, you know, coconut water. Or I really, I really love sparkling water. Or you know what? Actually, when I get home, I eat one piece of delicious chocolate. Right? See, like, you can, you can insert anything as the reward for getting through your work day. <laughs> And so much of what God is doing in all of us is he's saying, listen, I know you could do it this way, but actually there's a more excellent way. There's a better way. There's a way that's less destructive. There's a way that actually embraces more and more of what I'm trying to do in your life. And for all of us, we're being invited into it. So it always begins to, with who the Lord is and what he's doing. But then from there, what we also learn here in Psalm 23 is it's important that you and I don't forget all of God's benefits, Like, God's benefit package is extraordinary, right? And Psalm 23 gives us a whole list of the benefits that come from walking with the Lord and knowing God. Now, I'm going to say this up front. The ultimate benefit is not the things he does for us. It's his very presence and his character. Okay, so, so God, the personality of God, the Godhoodness of God, God's personhood is more than enough. Like, you will not meet a kinder, more loving, more amazing, more generous, more forgiving person than God. Plain and simple. But with his amazing personality and the way God works and who he is, there also is all of these benefits that come from knowing him. And oftentimes, on the journey of life, we start to forget the benefits, And that's what happens when we start to stray into areas that we don't belong. Like, let's look at Psalm 23 again. Look at these different benefits we see in verse one. Because the Lord is my shepherd, it says what? I shall not want. So one of his benefits is the gift of contentment. In verse three, it says, after it says, he makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside the still waters. And it says, he what? He restores my soul. And then it says, and he leads me in righteous paths for his own namesake. So that you think you can be content. You have a restoration that goes. And the idea of the soul is in the inward person, not the outward person who is interacting with the world, but who you are on the inside, right? And then you also have the benefit of God's leading. And God's leading is down paths of what is right. That's what righteousness means. It means all the things that pertain to what is right, And God is constantly saying, listen, because you know me, I want to lead you down these paths of rightness, the things that make for all that is righteous. But then not only that, in verse four, it says, hey, when I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, it says, I will what? I'll fear no evil because you are with me. Talk about a benefit. In the midst of scary times, when when times are scary, we don't have to fear the evils that are around us. Man, I have been quoting this to people all the time because we're living in a day and age now where being really worked up about what's going on in the world is like a calling card for believers. 
More believers than I've ever seen any other time. The people are flipped out over everything. And you're like, hey, it doesn't say that there isn't evil in the world. It says you don't need to fear it because you fear God. But for too many of us, we're fearing, like, oh my God, they're gonna, they're gonna take away our Bibles. They're not gonna take away our Bibles. Especially if your word is hidden where? Yeah, it's already in there, people. You can't take that away. But like, and I say this because it says one of God's benefits is you don't need to fear the evil in the world. There's been evil in the world as long as since the fall of Adam and Eve. Murder's been in the world since Cain killed Abel. Unrighteousness has been in the world all of human experience after the eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you don't have to fear the evil. You're aware that it's there, but you don't have to be afraid of it. And it says, one of God's benefits, I'll fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Talk about a benefit, the presence of God. We keep saying we want to be a people of God's presence, right? Notice what it says next. It doesn't even stop there. I love this. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I love that. There's comfort for us. In verse five, in the presence of our enemies, it says that God prepares a table before us. I love this. You anoint my head with oil and my cup, what? Runs over. Talk about a benefit. The anointing of someone's head with oil. Now, now, like, I realize that, like, you know, we live in a, cosmetics are different in this day and age. Back in the day, all you had was a little oil, Right? And, and so the oil was fragrant. And, and, and when you, somebody would anoint your head with oil, it literally spoke of, 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 this, of this blessing, this anointing. And because of God's presence, in the presence of your enemies, your cup is overflowing. Now, I don't know about you. If I was sitting at, and, and this was like, like, remember I told you in like New Jersey, people would be, like they would, they would talk very truthfully to you. They'd be mean to you, right? I, don't, I didn't think it was mean. They were just honest. Like I grew up in the kind of place where people are like, listen, you're talking. I just want you to know I don't like you. <laughs> And so if I walk away, just know it's because I just don't want to listen to you anymore. And some people are like, that's so mean. It's like, at least you knew where you stood. Now people are like, oh, we just, you're so nice. And go, oh, I hate that guy, you know? <laughs> and, and so, so I, well, it's funny, but if you're, sitting, if you're David sitting at the, in the presence of his enemies, like someone could get knifed in that environment. Like someone could get like literally off, like Luca Brazzi sleeps with the fishes kind of off. Do you know what I mean? like John Wick style offing, you know what I mean? But David's like, when I'm sitting in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil and, you, and I have an overflowing cup. He's, he's like, even in the presence of maybe an altercation that could lead to my death, my cup is overflowing with joy. Talk about a benefit, right? The kind of person who's not like, yeah, man, I wasn't just totally freaked out sitting at that table, but, but inside my cup was overflowing. And then... Gosh, verse six, is, it's like a powerhouse of benefits. That hope, we talked about it last week, that goodness and mercy will pursue me all of my days, my good days and my bad days. And I'm gonna have the ability to dwell in God's house forever. Don't forget God's benefits. Listen to David in Psalm 103, verses one to five. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then David starts to list the benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. But let me ask you today, my friend, my brother, my sister, maybe you're here today, you're skeptical. Have you forgotten the benefits that come from knowing God? See, one of the things that goes on for all of us, the enemy of your soul wants to obscure the beautiful gifts and blessings of God from our eyes. He comes and says, did God really say if you eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're surely dying? That's not why God doesn't want you to eat it. He doesn't want you to eat it because he doesn't want you to be like him. God's holding out on you. That's what the enemy does. See, he lies. He's the father of lies. He's been lying since the beginning. And for each one of us, as we're moving through life, the enemy is lying to us. Our culture lies to us and says, no, no, man, you don't want to walk with Jesus. There's a better way. You, you, won't have to, you won't have to deal with all that stuff. You don't have to worship anybody. You can sit at the center of your life. And our culture drives that. And it's in all of our 
programs. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not anti-TV. I'm not like, listen, you should, you know, kill your television. Don't watch anything on Netflix because Netflix is the evil one. Listen, entertainment is fine, but you realize we're getting pumped this worldview all day long. All your news sources, your phones, my phone, your internet, my internet, all of it. It's pumped through all of it. You're the center. You're the most important. You do it your way, right? That's pumped through. And then what happens is, is over time, you're like, man, if I didn't follow Jesus, then I can have this benefit. I can do this thing, right? And then before you know it, you land in that place where you're like, oh, I don't want this guy to rule over me. I don't want to worship Jesus. I, I want the glory. I want to do what I want. I want to be my authentic self. I'm here to tell you your authentic self needed redemption, and so did mine. Who you are at the core and who I am at the core is broken and fallen. I know this because just look back on your past. Everybody who lived their authentic lives at some point, like, I shouldn't have done that. That was really bad. That hurt a lot of people and me. So when you look back on it, you realize that you living your authentic life is exactly what Jesus has redeemed us from. So we have to remember his benefits. How good is it to move through life with our sins forgiven? Oh, man, I wouldn't go back, not for one second when I carried around the shame and the brokenness of my life before Jesus. I would ne- I never want to go back there. I remember what it was like waking up in the morning as a college student, being like, what happened last night? That was supposed to be fun. Why did I do that? And I always tell my kids, praise God this was before everyone had cell phone cameras. I would be virtually unemployable at this point. Because if everyone had had social media when I was that, it would have been horrible. Like, it's just like, there's no way I'd be able to be not only your pastor, anyone's pastor. (laughs) They'd be like, was this you in college? Yes. Sorry. (laughs) Sorry. It was that like, it was like, I don't miss those days. I don't miss when I did all the things that I was like, man, you did this, this is so much fun. And after it's over, you just feel completely empty on the inside. Like when Jesus said, I remember the first time I read it, what does a prophet a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? And I'm like, that is totally me. I didn't need someone to tell me. It was like, I read that, I'm like, that is me. I've gotten everything and I'm lost. I'm empty, I'm, I'm numb on the inside. There's not one day I would, I wouldn't give anything to go back there. Don't forget the benefit of what it means to be forgiven. Don't forget what it means, the benefit of what it means to be healed. Oh, and not only the healing from all the, man, the healings from my obsession with myself. Oh, the, the healings from a worldview that I am the center of my solar system. What a gift to be displaced from the illusion that I am the most important person in the world. Oh, my friends, don't forget that benefit. Don't forget the fact that he redeems your life from destruction. Man, we can go around, we get, people come up and say, man, this is me in the gutter. I always like to say, Jesus heals from the guttermost to what? The uttermost, right? And some of us have some pretty gnarly gutter stories, don't we? Like where, where, where we found ourselves in the gutter. And some of us experienced destruction on this side of eternity, but outside of Jesus, ultimate destruction was the inevitable outcome. The benefit of his healing from our destruction. I'm just like walking down the list here that I read to you in Psalm 103. He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Oh, see, now that changes now. Now it's not what he has redeemed us from, but what he has brought us into. Man, do you realize that the king of kings has crowned us with his loving kindness and his tender mercies. Don't forget his benefits. He himself is the ultimate benefit, but in who he is, he brings such gifts. You know, if anybody goes for a job today, they're like, well, what's the benefits package, right? And listen, if you never did that, and if you're looking at a job, that's a good question. Like, because, you, you know, there's health insurance and, you know, there's, there's retirement and there's all these different things. And maybe, you know, maybe you go to a company and you're like, hey, man, like, you know, I love that food. And they're like, well, listen, you get, you know, 70% off for life. You're like, I'll, I'll, I'll work there for that, <laughs> right? That's a good benefit. And God's benefits package is beyond our comprehension. It's an eternal benefits package. It's ages upon ages without end. 
of us walking in the blessedness of what it means to be called a child of God, the beloved of God. So to bring Psalm 23 and just bring it all together, right? It starts with the Lord and what he's done and don't forget his benefits. So what should we do? My friends, you and I, we need to just simply respond to Jesus. Because everything in this Psalm begins with the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then Jesus shows up in John's gospel and says, I am the good shepherd. See, he's saying, listen, I, the shepherd leads the sheep. And Jesus comes and says, listen, I'm the, I, I'm the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. So he's not just a hireling. He's not just going to be around for a while when the going gets tough. He's out. No, he's willing to go to the greatest lengths to protect and care and nurture his people. And I love this because the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I want to share with you how we've been going through this series. I shared it in our pre-service prayer. And I just want to encourage you. Come to our pre-service prayer here at Crossroads at 815. It is literally like, it's such a powerful, it's one of my favorite parts of my entire life is 815 on a Sunday morning here at Crossroads as we pray together. But I shared with the, with the crew that was here this morning to pray that God's been really challenging me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. If I'm simply responding to Jesus, because Jesus is my shepherd, then I live a life without lack. That's what shall not want means, right? It's like you there's nothing lacking in my life because he's my shepherd. But what I'm constantly learning is that when I feel lack, which if I'm honest, I do often, right? Like there's not enough time. I don't have enough energy. My kids eat all the dessert and I wanted thirdsies. Like, you know, like, what do you mean you ate all the M&Ms? Like you didn't just save me one, you know, like all the parents of kids are like, hey man, that's so real. When they move out, you, hide, you don't even have to hide it anymore until they come back and visit, and then you hide it again. <laughs> it's so true, right? Anytime I feel lack, I feel like the Lord is saying, Daniel, wherever you feel that your life is lacking, it's where you're not letting me be your shepherd. So every time I'm like, Lord, everything would be better if the Lord's like, Daniel, you're not letting me be your shepherd when you feel like that. And at each point when that happens, when I catch myself complaining about my perceived lacks, I feel like the Lord's like, no, 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 listen. It's an invitation for you to be shepherded by me. Because, because I'm the good shepherd, your life lacks nothing. You have everything you need. And brothers and sisters, we say here at Crossroads that we're simply responding to Jesus. We say it's our, our mission because literally the life that God has for you is on the other side of you allowing Jesus to transform your natural reactions to biblical responses. And in every situation, he is saying, will you live your life in response to me? Will you trust even though you can't see? Will you step out even though you're scared? Will you forgive even though you don't want to? Will you walk in hope although everything seems impossible? Will you believe that I can restore and redeem what has broken down? And at every one of those crossroads in our lives, he's saying, let me be your shepherd and live a life without lack because everything you need, you'll find in me. And let that be our lives, not just today, but every day. Let's bow our heads and our hearts as we pray together. Father, I want to thank you that you initiate everything. Lord, you initiated the creation of all that is created. Lord, you initiated interacting with humans, whether it be Adam or Noah or Abraham or Moses or David or Deborah or you know, all through the Bible. 
Lord, you initiated sending Jesus on a rescue mission for us. You initiated the cross and the resurrection. And Lord, you initiated the pouring out of your Holy Spirit. And there's not one of us who is here today who knows you because we initiated it, but you initiated all of it. So Lord, we want to live our lives in response to you. And Lord, forgive us for forgetting all the benefits of what, it, what comes from knowing you. And Lord, as we read in Psalm 23, Lord, we want to experience who you are in real time at street level where we live. Lord, we want to live a life without, without lack. Lord, we want our souls to be restored. We want our cups to run over. We want to be led in the paths of righteousness for your own glory. God, we want our heads to be anointed with oil. Lord, we want your rod and your staff to comfort us. We want to be people who know your presence. And Lord, we want to be the kind of people who know and hope that you're going to be pursuing us all the days of our lives and that our dwelling place should be in your family for all time. But Lord, at street level where we live, you're inviting all of us to be changed. You don't just want us to believe things. You want the things that we believe to impact the way that we live our lives every day. As James said, faith without works is dead. So Lord, we, we, we want to believe the right things, the biblical things, but we also want it to make its way from our heads to our hearts, out to our hands, to our feet, out our mouths. And so Jesus, we are asking that you would help us to better simply respond to you. We want to be led by your spirit. We want to be driven by your spirit. God, we want to be convicted by your spirit. We want to be empowered by your spirit. And God, we don't want to resist you anymore in any ways.